This is the Dr. Haley Show podcast. Today, we're going to talk about how to know if mold is in your home affecting your lives. Today's guest is Brandon Faust, who owns a company in Clearwater, Florida, Mold Solutions. He's the founder and industry leading indoor air quality company specializing in top tier remediation, atomized sanitation, and duct cleaning. Brandon, thank you for joining me on the Dr. Haley Show podcast. You're in Tampa area, Clearwater, Florida. That's correct. Yes. I'm a little curious about that. How'd you end up in Tampa, Florida? I actually went to University of Tampa many, many years ago. Oh, uh, did you? Yeah. How'd you end up there and how long have you been there? So I've been um, in Tampa Bay since 2017 and uh, my wife is Venezuelan and uh, she has a lot of family in the Tampa Bay area. Our son He's six years old, and we moved here with the intention of having a family. With the supporting cast that was available in Tampa, we decided that this was a good place to do it. So I couldn't be happier. I love it in Tampa Bay. You got there right about the good time to be a Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan then with uh, your quarterback. What was his name that was uh, so great? Mr. Uh, Brady, Brady, I believe. Yeah, the greatest of all time, Tom Brady. <clears throat> it's funny because I became a Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan again. Uh, for those couple of years and wow what a show but it's true it's true we were able to make it to a few games with him playing so <clears throat> definitely wow. felt like that was a fortunate experience yeah oh that would have been awesome questions about the whole mold remediation first of all how did you get into it what happened in your life that made that important to you Initially, it was just fortuitous. A friend of mine asked me to come on board to help him with his company. And my background was definitely not in mold. You know, I had worked in the construction industry at a young age because my dad run, ran a construction company on the West Coast. When I was initially approached on it, I actually told my friend I wasn't interested. But then he said, look, there's equity involved if you do get involved. And with the baby on the way, I said, you know what, that might be a good idea. So we got going and quickly on, I realized that this was a really important subject. And specifically, it was after my son was born at a month old, he was waking up with a really hard time breathing, almost like an asthma attack, three days in a row. And my wife was pretty much ready to take him to the emergency room. And at, at that point in time, I said, look, totally fine, but let's just make sure that it's not environmental. Because one of the things that can occur due to mold or mold toxins is respiratory issues. So I started looking for the environmental triggers and I moved this one shelving system and there was two feet up of mold, two foot wide. So basically four feet, four square feet of mold in the same room where the air handler was pulling air from. And that was distributing all throughout the house. Hmm. So we fixed it, handled the leak that brought about the mold in the first place, cleaned up the contaminated material. And the next day he slept an hour longer and he had no trouble breathing at all. So that was really the point where it switched from a opportunity, like a business opportunity to uh, a mission and something that I felt really passionate about because I thought about what would have occurred had we taken them to the emergency room, they would not have found the actual cause of the breathing issues in the first place. Although I don't disagree with obviously getting treated if you need treatment, but you also want to find the actual thing that's causing it to begin with. All right. Right. Yeah. Chances are, if you go to a doctor for the symptoms, they're going to say, oh, okay, well, things are runny. So let's give you something to, you know, solidify that stuff. So you're not running so much and your drowsy will wake you up or you can't sleep. will put you to sleep. They're not getting to the cause of the problem. What's causing these allergy like symptoms? Correct. Yes. I got some very broad questions first because. Sure. Uh, and a lot of my audience will have mold issues. Right. And when they go to the doctors, it seems like they're treating them forever and ever and ever, which probably means they're not getting rid of the problem or maybe they're stuck in their environment. So before we say, what can you do about the environment? I'm curious about how to avoid it to begin with. What are some things to look for? And I'll give an example. My wife and I were searching for a new home about five years ago. And we found one we absolutely loved. It was underpriced. It was, you know, a, a small <clears throat> mansion and on a huge property, much nicer than everything in the area size wise. Yeah. And, and the property was much larger than all the neighbors properties. It was huge, surrounded by this big extra area of land that was owned by the city that they could not do anything with. So it was like having additional property. 
Wow. We walked in the front door, and for me, there was this instant sense of there's something wrong with the air in here, almost mm. like a little bit of a burning in my nasal passage that my wife didn't experience. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a fountain right in the main entryway there that was empty and turned off. But I suspected, okay, this place in Florida, which already has too much humidity, mm -hmm. they were probably breeding mold, and it's probably in the walls, and I happen to be sensitive to it. I'm wondering, could I have fixed that house and really made out well, or did I do the right thing and say, let's just go look at another home? Well, that's a good question. I wouldn't ever turn away from a, a home because of a mold issue. But it's also because I'm extremely confident in our ability to handle any size mold issue. But it also is how much money are you going to potentially have to put into it to really resolve it? Because if it was a slow leak and it had been going on for a while, there's a good chance that that entire bottom section of that home would need to be gutted and properly treated. And then you would have to make sure that the ducts were properly cleaned and potentially in some cases... Uh, removed and replaced. And then you would then need to do a whole home detox for that particular structure. So it, there's a lot of steps that go into it. And depending on the size of the home and depending on how far and wide that problem is, it, it could be rather costly. So if you're able to get you know a credit for what it's going to take to handle it and you're able to get an accurate estimate, which is also not necessarily an easy task, especially when it comes to mold, because in a lot of ways, it's the tip of the iceberg. You're actually looking at something <clears throat> and then you find out that it actually goes way deeper, way further. Mm -hmm. So I have the ability to handle any sort of situation with my team, <clears throat> especially if it's residential. Unless you had a pretty large credit, you probably were correct to walk away from. Well, I do think it was built into the price of the home and they must have known something. Uh, but at the same time, the other thing is, is, okay, well, how long is it going to be before I can even move into this home? You know, gutting, I'm assuming that means removing drywall, possibly br taking up laminate floors. And you mentioned the duct work, probably almost like a complete. Biblically, there's something in the scriptures that talks about bringing the priest out to inspect it after, you know, treatments. And at some point in time, they say, just burn it down. That's true. Let's talk about that in the Bible, right? So, you know, that that's why I ask these things. Now, obviously, we have technology that wasn't available then, and we have scientific testing, and we know what kills what. Um, so I guess we probably have ways of avoiding burning the house down. You know, it's funny. It was kind of humorous, but my wife had come up with a promotional item that she thought would be good for our company, Mold Solutions. And it was a matchbook, a box of matches. They would say, in case mold solutions can't handle it, right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> to your point, it does talk about burning the house down, which really, hopefully, that never has to happen at this at this juncture. And you can find a company that properly remediates, knows what to do to really make sure that all of it is gone. And that really is the task that is difficult because you're talking about a microscopic enemy and you're talking about mold spores that are seven microns. And to put that in sort of real world perspective, you can fit 10 mold spores on the tip of a human hair. So the human hair is 70 microns in diameter. So it's impossible to see it with the naked eye. And then the gas that it releases, which tends to be poisonous, is even smaller. So when we're doing a mold remediation project, we're basically trying to get rid of and remove as much as possible something that is completely invisible. And the only way to really do that is through redundancy and having multiple avenues of removal to make sure you cover every aspect, every square inch, every nook and cranny of the home so that could impact the air quality. And you're also dealing with certain aspects of the home that in some cases are unreachable, like the middle of the ducts. So how do you deal with that? Mm. And none of it is absolute. I wish there was something that was 100% handling. But at this point in time, I don't know of anything that's 100% when it comes to mold remediation. Hmm. That's the unfortunate isness. Unless you remove the original material, but sometimes you're talking about structural material as well. So I tell clients, the only way to really handle like a duct system, for example, completely is to remove and replace the duct system and the HVAC system. Now we can take an advanced 
approach to remediating the ducts and cleaning the ducts that will get probably 80% of it. But even then, it's not absolute. It's not a total handling. Hmm. I understand. What about people that are shopping for condos where mm -hmm. maybe each unit has its own duct system, but you have sloppy neighbors that leave the windows open and have high humidity in Florida? <clears throat> Does it jump from one unit to the other? You know, usually in the, the condos, they have a firewall or they have something that separates the actual units one to the next. But in some cases, that's not always the way it is. We've definitely had condos where there was damage from the kitchen of the other unit. It has now moved into your unit. And the only way you're going to get them to properly handle it is by removing all of their kitchen cabinets. So what happens if they refuse? Your only option at that point in time is to clean it as best as possible, remove it using like HEPA vacuuming and wipe down and treating the actual material and probably then encapsulating it. Then you would need to address the building envelope of the unit that you're actually living in, which I strongly recommend doing like a whole home sanitization. We use a non-toxic product for that that is fantastic at removing airborne mold spores and actually dissolving mycotoxins. And then in some cases, we'll even uh, double it up with an ozone treatment. The most important factor of all is what is the source? Locating any sort of water intrusion issues and removing the actual colonized mold. Because even mold that may be the water source may be gone and it's still there, it can reactivate through humidity alone in some cases where it's over 60% humidity. And you'll wind up with a problem where the mold actually starts to activate. The other aspect of it is the mold could become dry, which will make it more brittle and it will release more spores and it can actually cross contaminate the house when it becomes dry. Yeah, I understand because the spores are sort of indestructible. What you need a, a blue flame or what kills them? They are microscopic. They are, of course, part of the microbial kingdom that, you know, it was really a fungal kingdom, but in terms of dealing with microbes and microbial contaminants or pathogens, it is one of those things. It, it is tiny and through vinegar or hydrogen peroxide, you can actually break it down and oxidize it. So there will, you can actually destroy them. And that's truthfully what you're doing when you're treating it the appropriate way. But the most important factor to keep in mind is that mold is a living, breathing organism. So when you attack it, it actually wants to defend itself and attack back. So it will release more spores and it will also release the mycotoxin. And myco is the Greek word for fungus and toxin, obviously something that's poisonous that's released by an organic, you know, material. So this organic, you know, existence is sitting there wanting to make sure its territory is protected. So when you spray it with bleach or you spray it down with, even if it's a product that is a better product, that's not as toxic in, in itself, you're still going to get some sort of a release similar to taking, you know, kicking a hornet's nest. You know, if you're, if you're going to mess with a hornet's nest, you don't want to just kick it. You don't want to just spray it with a hose. You know, you probably would want to put on personal protective equipment and go gently remove it, you know, or put it somewhere else so that you're not agitating it. And even then, you know, you want to have the PPE, the personal protective equipment, or you're going to get stung. Now imagine if you're allergic to hornets and you go ahead and you try to do that, it can be really bad for the end user. So the way that we're doing it through removal and agitation, we're also following up afterwards with a, you could call it almost like a fogging system where it lingers for about 30 minutes so that anything that is airborne and anything that has been released by the mold, the colonized mold, is actually being shot into a fog that destroys it. It sounds kind of like treating a home for termites, only it's not going to necessarily get into all the cracks like treating a home for termites would. Which is why, in some cases, you have to remove flooring, maybe, or walls, or... So I got into the industry under the impression or, you know, the, the original company that I was part of, started out as a uh, demolition free mold remediation company and i just found out within the first year that maybe there were limitations to that process and then in fact there were major limitations when i got sick in 2019 after i had treated my house and the air samples were fantastic and it wasn't until 
my AC overflowed six months later. So I was removing the continuous flooring and I got to the master bedroom, popped a baseboard and there was a toxic mold called Ketomium behind the baseboard. And I was like, well, I know what I'm looking at. So I'm going to have to remove this and started to open up the walls. And sure enough, it went up about two feet. <clears throat> and so I had two different molds that were fighting it out in my hmm. master bedroom where I thought it was a safe zone. And in, actual, in actuality, it was a biological warfare zone. Well, you said you were removing continuous flooring. I'm assuming you're talking about something like laminate floor. Correct. Like a luxury vinyl plank. Yeah. And in your case, because you had this instance of water damage, <clears throat> you had made the decision, okay, I know what happens when you have water damage. I'm getting this floor out of here. Of course, because they say it's waterproof. But the thing that they don't tell you is that, well, what happens if you get water underneath it? What if the water goes underneath the flooring? Well, then it stays there. So then you basically run the possibility of having water that can, is stagnant and you know can get bacterial growth occurring uh, microbial growth occurring and i've opened up enough lvp to tell you that it, it definitely can get you know pathogens caught underneath and it can impact the health of the homeowner right so i had one homeowner i had gone to this house earlier and didn't know i had forgotten that i'd been to this house earlier and had done like a water damage assessment and had been basically helping out a friend who is a real estate agent and was doing an initial inspection for her on this home um, because the homeowners wanted it done. So I go in there, do it. And I say, look, the floors are going to need to be removed. I'm detecting, you know, high moisture, especially in this area. But there's a chance that all the flooring in this house is going to have to come out. And they had wood on slab. I write my proposal in terms of what needs to happen. And the agent basically tells them, Brandon's a little bit, you know, extreme. Don't really worry about it. It's just that old Florida smell, not that big a deal, right? And they move ahead. They move ahead and they buy the house. So two years later, I'm at the same house, not realizing it was the same house. And they had put down luxury vinyl plank on top of this wood flooring. They covered up the, the wood flooring with the LVP. And what they did was they basically put a moisture barrier on top of the wood flooring. And then once it was opened up, it was 80% of the home was covered in a mold called Ketomium. And it's a very, it's a highly toxic mold. And mm -hmm. then there was some other stuff too, Aspergillus as well. But they created a problem unwittingly, unknowingly, you know, by putting this moisture barrier or this vapor barrier on top of their flooring and they had been fatigued and sick and headaches and respiratory issues for over a year and they couldn't figure out why and once they moved out of the house all of that stuff started to dissipate within, within four, four days. days so the question is you know can your home make you sick and the this unquestionably and resoundingly the answer is yes wow at what point do you actually choose to remove the luxury vinyl flooring or whatever it was called, the LV. <laughs> LVP, luxury vinyl plank. Yeah. Or, or the drywall, you know, are there tests you can do where you, you know, make a small opening and, and test or? There is. So probably one of the most precise methods of testing is actually doing a cavity sample behind a wall. You create a hole probably the size of a pin. You put a tube in there and you run your suction pump for five minutes or whatever it is, the, the inspector kind of can tell you exactly how long they want to run it for. They send it to the lab and they tell you what's going on behind the wall to whatever degree. So the, a lot of testing in the methodology which is used is they actually put a pump in the middle of the room, which actually tends to be the least exposed area because the majority of the time, the mold is going to be behind the wall, it's under a window, near pipes, or something along those lines where there's some sort of a water source. The sampling methodology, which we use, I feel is lacking in many respects and to determine if there's actually an issue. And then the, the, the other aspect of it is that certain spores are heavier than others. So you might have, for example, stachybotrys, which is the technical term for uh, black mold, and that spore is a heavy spore. So you could have it where there's clearly black mold in large amounts of it in that room. And then you do an air sample and it shows up that it's completely clean and it's not necessarily an accurate test at all. And then on top of it, 
they're really just looking for the spores. When you have this testing of the suction pump, it's a spore trap. So the thing that actually makes people sick is the mycotoxin. And the mycotoxins are not tested in that type of sampling methodology. Now, the mycotoxin is the toxins that are released by the mold spores themselves or the mold colony. So, colony, yeah. So you basically have three stages of mold to kind of be aware of. The colonized mold, which you can see clearly, it's like fuzzy or it's black or it's white or I mean, it comes in so many different colors. Honestly, it's like the rainbow, but you can see it. Then there's the spores that it releases that the majority of time you cannot see. And then it's the mycotoxin, which is the poison or the substance. It's almost like a chemical that mold releases to defend itself. And it's like a, a skunk or a, a snake. It's got venom or it's got a, a perfume or a gas that it releases to, you know, defend off people that might attack it. I'm wondering if that's what I smelled when I walked into that home then, if it was the mycotoxin, not the mold. Very possibly. I mean, it's some sort of a VOC, it's some sort of a volatile organic compound, right? Microbial volatile organic compound that you're smelling. And the thing that's interesting is that you can't always smell it. You know, like when it was in my master bedroom, there was definitely no smell. There was no visual signs. It was just not something in, I had done the air samples that came back clean. And even as a professional mold guy, there was no indication that it was moldy. I had even, because I was fatigued and because I had a pain in my chest that wouldn't go away, because I was getting fevers once a month and had been sick for about six months, I thought, you know, is this mold? And I did a test um, through Mosaic. At the time, it was uh, Great Plains Laboratory. They have a mycotoxin test. So I did this test and I came back highly elevated in a number of different mycotoxins. And I thought because the air samples came back clean that it must be from going into other people's, you know, moldy homes. And sure enough, once I opened up the walls and found what I found, it was clear that at least half of it was because of being in my own, my own bedroom. And the, the proof is that within three weeks of removing the contaminated material and doing the detailed cleaning and the micro cleaning, within three weeks, 90% of my symptoms went away. All right. I want to clarify something um, because when we're talking about testing, did you just say you were tested as opposed to the air in your place? So it was a, a, a test as a person. I'm sick. What's wrong with me? Do I have mycotoxins? Correct. So there's a number of different companies that do it, but it's a urine sample. And I think there's some blood blood testing that you can also do that will give you some sort of a concept if you're being exposed. But in my case, I did a test with mosaicdx.com um, or mosaic diagnostics. And you basically, you know, through a practitioner, um, they basically give you the test. You, you pee in a cup and then you send, you freeze it and send it off to the lab. And then they you know, within a couple of weeks tell you, you have this amount of mycotoxins and this is considered elevated or this is considered within a normal range. So, you know, for me, you know, five to 50 was considered elevated. I was at 1,215. So I was mm. like off the charts in one particular mycotoxin. In in some cases, the people that are, have a difficult time detoxing, they actually might even hold on to it. And it's clear that they do have a mold issue. There's mold in their home. But if they are one of those that don't detox at the same speed, they may not even show up in the mycotoxin testing that's actually for the human body mm. compared to the testing that gets done in the home. I know there's a big facility out there, Spinalgo Wellness near you. I don't know if you've run into mm -hmm. that. Uh, Dr. Spinalgo, yeah. If you go to their website, the first thing they have on there is mold, you know, uh, can, people that we help, people that are have been exposed to mold and then other things like Lyme and um, all those weird symptomatic things that tend to linger and, you know, people struggle with year after year. I did notice you also have a perfect five-star rating on Google with 175 reviews. Very well done thank there. I thank you. like to think I do a good job. I know what it yeah. takes to be a 4.9, let alone a 5.0. So well done. We do have one two-star review, uh, although we worked on getting it rectified. He just wasn't... You know, uh, every once in a while, a technician has a bad day. And truthfully, um, I think that our rating comes from our willingness to communicate and resolve issues, because I would love to say we're as perfect as our ratings look, but we live on planet Earth and things happen, right? <laughs> but we, we, we strive 
to do an exceptional job. We are a health-centric mold remediation company. And with my own personal journey on this with my son and with myself, I really try to make it clear to my technicians that, hey, look, this is the health of people that is at stake. And uh, we're not just a normal remediation company. So we have to up our game. Absolutely. You know, so, Absolutely. Yeah. Every challenge is an opportunity to learn how to do things better the next time. So whenever I'm shopping for a company, I like to go to the reviews and reverse order them and start with the worst. Yes. And for my company, we don't have that perfect 5.0. We have some that are less than five stars, but it's usually like uh, I gave you a four because your aloe vera doesn't taste good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, can't, exactly. I can't fix that. I'm sorry. Yeah, you can't fix it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it is what it is. We're, we sell something right from the plant. <laughs> but uh, so it's, it's almost impossible to have perfect 5.0 across the board. I get that. We definitely work on it. No doubt about it. I'm curious about some of the treatment. I'm not going to say chemicals because you didn't mention chemicals. You talked about vinegar, for example, and you, you mentioned the ozone. Right. Is treating with vinegar the same as treating with bleach? Obviously, vinegar is acidic. Bleach is alkaline. So they're opposite ends. Do they both work or is one better than the other? I, I would never use bleach to treat a mold situation. Bleach releases toxic fumes in itself. So you're adding toxicity to the house rather than removing it. And the whole goal is to make the home as safe and clean as possible, safe and healthy as possible. So I'm always trying to use products that I would be willing to use in my own home. You know, and I have a six year old and a five year old and a, a boxer, you know, so I want to make sure that everybody's okay, my wife and myself included. The other aspect of it is you're never going to aerosolize bleach, right? To me, just the sound of that is terrifying uh, as far as a, an option. So the way that we do it with, you know, aeros aerosolizing our product or creating a, a fog is it needs to be potent enough that it's going to break down the mold spores and help to dissolve mycotoxins but safe enough that, you know, you can be back in the home three hours afterwards. And so we've treated over 3,000 homes in Tampa Bay and really have a pretty impeccable record in terms of the satisfaction with our clients and also the, the feedback. And the feedback that we get on a continual basis is I had the best night's sleep that I've had in years, the home felt fresh. First time I was able to take a deep breath, the air felt lighter, these types of things. I had one of my clients who her husband runs a really well-known uh, wellness center here in, in Clearwater. They were doing a duck change out and the ducks had quite a bit of uh, contamination and growth in the ducks. And while they were doing the change out, it basically cross-contaminated the home. And she had this cough that would not go away. It was this lingering cough, you know, like this dry cough. She said, I need you to come in and do an, a quick handling for me. And we did it. I reached out to her the next day. Hey, just wanted to check in on you. She said, the cough is gone. You yeah. know, so, you know, we're not doctors, of course. We're just mold people. But when I look at our purpose and our job, we're helping people because if you can't clean the house or if the house is toxic, those people are going to have health issues, no matter how good the doctor is. You know, they can do all kinds of stuff to basically repair the body, fix the body or treat the body. But it's similar to like if, you know, your hand is burnt and it got burnt by putting it on the stove and you go back home every night and you put it back on the stove, it's never going to heal. So similarly, if your home is what's causing the issues due to toxicity or environmental triggers or bacteria or whatever it may be, if you keep going back into the toxic environment, you're never going to get a recovery. Brandon, I got some uh, questions about the business side a little bit. Okay. How often is insurance involved? That's an intriguing question. Truthfully, the majority of my business is actually retail. We focus on a particular clientele that is uh, looking for um, solutions in terms of air quality. And the insurance end of it is going to cover a water damage event. So whether it's a leaky pipe or a leaky roof or something that occurred that is tangible that you can see it was a, at a particular time, this is what happened. That's usually what they cover. So although we do do some insurance work, it's about 10% of the work that we're doing is actually insurance. 
It, it's involved and it can be. But the unfortunate part is a lot of the companies that work on an insurance basis, especially if they have a relationship with the insurance company, they are working for the insurance company. And it's probably similar in the healthcare industry that they are going to cover more traditional methods that are not necessarily kind of your holistic or, or alternative approaches. And that's unfortunate because that's really where you get to kind of root cause and what's actually the issue. So we do some of that work, but it's not our main line at all. We really want to be far more thorough than what the real estate or excuse me, the insurance is going to basically want to cover. And they basically cover it at a real estate transactional level. Like the testing that they do is based on the air samples, which are not necessarily a good yardstick. It's just a different level of remediation, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. You talked about HVAC, which I'm assuming stands something along the lines of air conditioning. Um, mm -hmm. Heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> How do you deal with it? And why can some mold remediation companies not properly handle the HVAC system? Another great question. In the state of Florida, legislatively, they created a massive problem or Potentially, it was a good call. I'm not 100% sure because HVAC is a technical subject. Mold is a technical subject. You do not want amateurs performing work on those systems. But in the state of Florida, an HVAC person cannot say that they handle mold. It's actually against the law. And it's against the law for a mold person to go into an HVAC unit. So my company, Mold Solutions, uh, also has a sister company called Real Duck Cleaning. And it's a company, I own both of them. And uh, in one of them, I have a partner who has been doing HVAC stuff for 25 years. And he trained all of our guys on how to do proper remediation on an HVAC unit or an air handler in the ducts and the whole system. So we're, we're, we're really one of the few companies in Florida that actually have both licenses to be able to do it. The HVAC unit is really the heart of the home. And those ducts is what it's those are the veins kind of feeding the rest of the body if you will or basically supplying what it needs so when you when that's contaminated it's absolutely going to impact the air quality as a whole so you can't do a proper mold remediation job without addressing the ducts in my opinion because if you had a hot spot that was releasing mold spores and mycotoxins and impacting the health of the home and the people that are living in the home, who's to say that that didn't cross contaminate with the various pressures that a home gets put under on a daily basis, whether it's the bathroom fan going on or the kitchen hood fan going on or doors opening and closing, you're going to have pulling and uh, pushing that takes place, which these things are microscopic. So the airflow alone can add to cross-contamination. So we always address the hot spot, the ducts, and then the entire body in that entire building envelope to have a complete solution. And that's what I tell you know my guys, look, at Mold Solutions, we provide the complete solution because there's not that many people that are doing all of this, but it's because of the indoor air quality as I as our priority. You know, that is our that is our product that we're trying to give over and turn over to our clients. How do you feel about the ozone makers that attach to the HVAC unit? You know, some people don't mind ozone. Um, I get a, a slight irritation from ozone, especially if it's on a continual basis. Now, with that said, I actually am a fan of ozone as a, as a tool when it's used appropriately and properly. So, for example, when we do like a full ozone treatment on a home, we're wanting to... All people, pets, and plants have to be out of that home during our treatment. Mm. Um, and there's also certain types of ozone that you want to use versus others. Okay, so there's two different types of ozone. One, the corona ozone is the, the better ozone. We use it, but it's when nobody's in the home. So when you have the purification devices that continually put out ozone, I don't particularly like it because it can cause irritation for some people. And then what I would recommend is I do think the purification devices are fantastic and, ne and necessary. The ones that do like ionization, where they put out positively charged or negatively charged molecules that make the other particles in the air stick together. I think that's great. Uh, I think that UV is fantastic and it's necessary to have in a system. There's other, you know, units that and there's different types and different technologies that each brand 
has. But overall, I think having a purification device in your HVAC or in your air handler is really vital. And, you know, bef before I forget, you actually, for your listeners, they can actually download. Um, it's a free download. It's an ebook, right? It's a mold ebook, preventing mold in a humid climate, you know, mold free living, preventing mold in a humid climate. So you can find that at moldebook.com. And it basically has 15 sections that goes over that exact point. Like what would be, for example, what would be the ideal setup for purification in your air handler? You know, because if you don't have it, your your chances of getting a, a moldy mess is a lot higher and it will happen a lot faster. You know, so it's one of those things. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. When you're dealing with humid air, you're dealing with porous material and you're dealing with mold spores, you know, and basically a swamp area, right? There's a good chance that you're going to wind up with mold in your handler, in your air handler and in your ducts. So these purification devices, the UV, I would put that in on the coils and on the blower wheel. And then the purification device, I would put that in the box that connects the air handler to the ducts themselves called a plenum. So I would plug that in. And it's one of those things that is very important for preventative uh, maintenance. And these are things that don't typically come with an air conditioning system when you have a new system installed in your home, I'm guessing. They do not. And they should. Mm -hmm. And whoever comes up with a um, an HVAC system that dries itself out, you know, and figures out how to put together a plenum without the porous material is going to be a very wealthy individual. Because it's a, it's a massive problem. And I would say it's probably in 80% of the homes in uh, in Florida. And most people have no idea that it's actually sitting there lingering in their mixing boxes. That, so basically you have the air handler itself. In most homes, you have uh, a split unit where you have the package outside, the condenser. Then you have the package inside your house, usually in a closet, an attic, or in your garage. Okay. And that connects to the ducts. So in that box, you have the coils that get very cold, right? And then you have the blower wheel that is basically blowing that cold air throughout your home. And that's usually connected by a box called the plenum. So the plenum then, you know, has these ducts it usually flex ducts sometimes metal ducts sometimes duct board that are connected to it and it shoots off into the various rooms and in some cases you have another square box or a tri triangular box that is an offshoot that shoots off other arms into other parts of the rooms and those mixing boxes are made of duct board and it's fiberglass porous material and those tend to be a real safe haven for microbial growth so we see a lot of those that are highly highly contaminated and you basically are breathing in a mold called cladosporium all through the night while you're sleeping or while you're in the home and most people have looked at cladosporium as a mold that's not particularly very concerning yet mo recent research has determined it does release a mycotoxin it does lead to respiratory issues it does lead to skin issues and it does you know cause toxicity issues that you really don't want to be dealing with wow. well this has been a very informative um nearly hour <laughs> is wow, there anything go. that wow. i missed that was important um that you wish i had asked I mean, you had some great questions. I think that, you know, this industry is really in its infancy in terms of the actual understanding. Um, many of the traditional, um, you know, remediators or guys that have been doing it for a while, they got their training early on. And you really, just like anything advances and technology advances, you have to keep digging deep and looking for the most effective ways to solve the problems. And um, I think that's crucial for any industry, but when there's, it's one of those things that there's not a lot of awareness on it. You know, it kind of goes un undetected or un it, people are not seeing what, they don't know what they don't know, right? And that is such an important element. I, I would also like your listeners to know that there's a group called um, Mold and Toxins Healing Your Home and Body on Facebook that is a fantastic resource. You know, I have no affiliation with the, the group, but I um, have seen the the administrator for that particular group. Her name is uh, Kendra Seymour, I believe. I've never met her, um, but I can tell you that she's trained in the same level of remediation that I got trained in. There's not that many of us that were trained on remediation for sensitized individuals. And although she's not a professional remediator, because the passion, the subject is so, such a passion for her, she's actually taken it that next step. She's actually the um, founder of the Change the Air Foundation. 
And she's put this resource together and there's so much information about mold and the proper remediation techniques. And I can tell you from what I've seen that it's a pretty good resource in terms of information for people that might be dealing with a mold problem. Okay. And I'll make sure that there's a link to that group uh, below this content, whether it's the video on YouTube or the, the actual podcast on iTunes or wherever you're seeing it. If you're on the blog page, links will be below in the resources area. We'll have a link to the ebook for the 15 tips and probably to your website too. Is it easy to get you to come out and test a home? You know, if we're in the Tampa Bay area, so we really specialize in the remediation. So in the state of Florida, you can't actually test and remediate on the same property within 12 months. So we have a number of different inspectors that we work with, you know, and help we go there with them and make sure that nothing's getting missed. So we put two sets of eyes on it. And we also then get a good idea of what we need to handle if the report does come back elevated or hot. But it, it's really important when you're choosing an inspector to pick one that knows where to look, what to look for, is not just kind of putting a pump in the middle of the room, is doing direct samples on top of air samples. And they might even want to, you know, partake in some sensitive testing as well. You know, and the, the cutest form of testing that I know of is a uh, canine going in and sniffing for mold in your home. So, so wow. um, it's it actually a pretty, yeah, it's a pretty effective way because, you know, it's very difficult for the traditional sampling methods to get to, you know, all the spots in a room quickly. Right. But the canine has been trained with this sniffer to basically pick up smells that we might not be able to pick up. So that's one way of also doing it. Ah, I want one of them to come to the house. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I love it. Brandon, hey, thank you so much. Um, I'm truly blessed by the time you spent with me today. And I know my listeners will be also. I appreciate you having me on. Honestly, anybody that's doing this type of work and making people aware of it, it's a, it's a fantastic thing. 